Recently, the Congressional Budget Office projected the budget deficit will surpass $1 trillion by 2020. Today, CBO Director Keith Hall spoke before the Senate Budget Committee on the budget and economic outlook. Good morning and welcome to our hearing on CBO's budget and economic outlook for fiscal years 2018 through 2028. Uh, Dr. Hall, thank you for this report. As you know, this update was delayed from its normal release in January due to congressional activity at the end of last year. I appreciate CBO's dedication to integrating into the final product analysis of last December's Tax Cuts and Jobs Act as well as the 2018 Bipartisan Budget Act and the Omnibus Appropriations Bill. It's vital that this committee have the most up-to-date information in order to understand the fiscal impact of the policies being implemented. This year's report, like so many before it, shines a spotlight on our country's unsustainable fiscal outlook. Automatic spending programs like Social Security and Medicare are growing disproportionately to the revenue and outpacing the economy. Uh, consider this. Automatic spending will soon consume all the taxes and revenues the federal government collects, and that's before one dollar goes to providing for our national defense and other priorities funded through so-called discretionary spending as part of the annual appropriations process. And... 70% of the total increase in outlays over the next 10 years is from Social Security, Medicare, and net interest on America's debt. Uh, Congress must come to terms with this overspending. Our government makes promises to pay for those programs without identifying a source of funding to ensure their sustainability. Dedicated taxes and fees are currently paying for less than half of the total mandatory spending. To really address this fiscal imbalance, uh, we can either reduce spending or increase our projected economic growth, but preferably some combination of the two. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act passed last year was a good first step toward growing our economy. It's already producing higher wages, more dollars in workers' paychecks, and increased domestic investment. And while we may have disagreements over the extent of its impact on the economy, both the Joint Committee on Taxation and CBO have confirmed that the tax cuts will have a positive impact on GDP growth. The Budget Committee continues to work toward setting a pro-growth legislative path for the upcoming year. Part of that has to be the process by which Congress budgets. We cannot continue to make last-minute deals that only add to our debt and ignore the structural policy changes needed for long-term sustainability or to spend money from the end of the 10-year period in the first year. The threat of a government shutdown should not be used to increase spending, but unfortunately since the 2011 failure of the Joint Select Committee on Deficit Reduction that was created by the Budget Control Act, we've seen this outcome time and again most recently culminating in the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018. This new law raised the caps on regular discretionary spending by $296 billion over fiscal years 2018 and 19. CBO estimates that if appropriations were to grow at the rate of inflation after 2018, rather than returning to Budget Control Act's lower caps, Discretionary spending would be one and seven tenths trillion higher over the next 10 years than it is under CBO's baseline. Many members of this committee have supported reforms to the budget and appropriations process, including automatic continuing resolutions and biennial budgeting. Senator Cotton has proposed eliminating the Budget Controls Act discretionary caps to end what he calls the bust and boom budget cycle. We need to reform our budget and appropriations process to end the specter of government shutdowns that leads to overspending. The truth is, however, that annual appropriations make up just a fraction of our total spending. 
To really address underlying problems, we need more time and effort put toward oversight and reducing the rate of growth of mandatory spending. Uh, Congress needs to focus more on addressing these autopilot programs in order to make them more effective and eliminate duplication. Uh, we need to set long-term goals to ensure a sustainable debt-to-GDP ratio so our overspending does not ultimately bankrupt the country. The continued growth of our national debt is something this committee and Congress needs to address. A balanced budget is the best outcome, but as the President's fiscal year 2019 budget shows, it's getting harder and harder to produce. While the correct debt-to-GDP goal is debatable, I think we can all agree this report's projected path approaching 100 percent over the next 10 years is not a good outcome. Dr. Hall, I look forward to your thoughts on what actions Congress could take to foster a stronger U.S. economy and reduce spending. Senator Sanders. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And Dr. Hall, thanks very much for being with us again. Um, Mr. Chairman, over and over again, uh, President Trump, his administration, and many of my Republican colleagues have made the claim that the tax plan that was passed that gave massive tax breaks to the richest people in this country would pay magically for itself. On September 28th, Secretary Mnuchin, Treasury Secretary, said, quote, not only will this tax plan pay for itself, but it will pay down debt, end quote. On October 22nd, President Trump said this about his tax plan, quote, if we pick up one point on GDP, that's $2.5 trillion, it's more, it more than pays for everything. End of quote. On December 4th, uh, Senate Majority Leader McC McConnell said, quote, I not only don't think the tax bill will increase the deficit, I think it will be, it will be beyond revenue neutral. In other words, I think it will produce more than enough to fill that gap. End of quote. And, Mr. Chairman, on... December 19th, you said, Mr. Chairman, quote, see, I'm quoting you. Thank you. That's how much I respect your work here. <laughs> quote, I am tired of the accusations the Republican budget hawks, and that definitely includes me, i.e. you, are willing to throw in the towel and accept a trillion and a half dollar deficit over the next 10 years. I'm still a deficit hawk, and here's why claims to the contrary that this tax bill will go unpaid for are based on an incomplete analysis of the tax bill. Fair quote. Okay. Well, Mr. Chairman, the result that has increased the deficit in the national debt over the past 17 years. Uh, there are wars. There are massive increases in military spending uh, that have added to the problems. So here we are, and this is a point, Mr. Chairman, that I want to make. When we talk about the government, we've got to talk about the American people, not just the government. We've got to talk about a declining middle class. We've got to talk about 40 million people living in poverty. We have to talk about the massive level of income and wealth inequality that exists in America. You just talked about, if I may say, in really about the necessity, in your view, about cutting Social Security uh, and Medicare. And I think that that is a very, very wrong idea. When you got millions of seniors in Vermont, Wyoming, and all over this country trying to get by on twelve, thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars a year, what we should not be doing as a nation is giving unbelievable tax breaks to billionaires and then say, oh, we gotta cut Social Security or take away health care benefits from the elderly in this country. That is a warped sense of priorities in my view. So I think when we talk about the budget, we have to talk about it in the broader context of what is happening in America. And what is happening in America is we're seeing a massive increase in income and wealth inequality. Does anybody here want to defend the fact that three people in America now own more wealth than the bottom half of the American people? Do we want to defend the reality that a very significant amount of new income today is going to the top 1%? So our job is to create an economy that works for all of us. And you don't do that, as the President proposed, by a trillion-dollar cut in Medicaid, $500 billion cut in Medicare. You don't do that by cutting Social Security. What you do do 
is say to the wealthiest people in this country, who in many ways have never had it so good, you recognize the fact that income and wealth inequality is worse today than at any time since the 1920s. You say to those people, start paying your fair share of taxes. And maybe we also want to think, may want to think about why we are expanding, increasing military spending by $165 billion over the next two years when you have veterans in this country sleeping out on the street. So, Mr. President, bottom line is, Mr. Chairman, the President's tax plan uh, is not going to lower the deficit. According to the CBO, it is going to increase the deficit. And the time is long overdue for us to get our priorities right, stop protecting working families in the middle class, not just wealthy campaign contributors. Thank you. Thank you, and I appreciate you quoting me. Um, but later, when you said that I said cut Medicare and Social Security, I have never said cut them. Okay. Then what did you mean when you talked about um, entitlement programs, when you talked about uh, those programs? What, was, what do you mean by that? I think you missed the part about uh, some of the duplication and effectiveness of making those programs, and I did not rule out an increase in um, the revenues for them. Something has to be done. It needs to be a combination, is what I said. All right. If I misquoted you, then I am sorry. But some of your colleagues, especially in the House, have talked about cuts to Social Security and Medicare. Thank you. this morning is Dr. Keith Hall, the Director of the Congressional Budget Office. Earlier this year, he appeared before this committee to discuss CBO's work and his efforts to increase responsiveness and transparency at the agency. This morning, Dr. Hall will be talking to us about CBO's latest projections and the challenges we face as a nation. We look forward to receiving your testimony. Uh, for the information of colleagues, Dr. Hall will take up to about seven minutes for his opening statement, followed by questions. Welcome, Dr. Hall. Please begin. Chairman Enzi, Ranking Member Sanders, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify about the Congressional Budget Office's most recent analysis of the outlook for the budget and the economy. My statement summarizes CBO's new baseline budget projections and economic forecast, which the agency released on Monday. In the Congressional Budget Office's baseline projections, which incorporate the assumption that current laws governing taxes and spending generally remain unchanged, the federal budget deficit grows substantially over the next few years. Later on, between 2023 and 2028, it stabilizes in relation to the size of the economy, though at a high level. As a result, federal debt is projected to be on a steadily rising trajectory throughout the coming decade, approaching 100% of gross domestic product by 2028. Projected deficits over the 2018 to 2027 period have increased markedly since we issued our last budget and economic projections in June of 2017. The increase stems primarily from tax and spending legislation enacted since then, especially the 2017 Tax Act, the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018, and the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2018. In our economic projections, which underlie our budget projections, Inflation-adjusted GDP, or real GDP, expands by 3.3% this year and by 2.4% in 2019. Most of this growth is driven by consumer spending and business investment, but federal spending also contributes a significant amount this year. Growth of real GDP exceeds the growth of real potential GDP over the next two years. This marked cyclical path in real GDP will occur in large part because the recent legislation provides significant fiscal stimulus at a time when there is very little slack in the economy. Those effects, as well as the larger federal budget deficits resulting from the new laws, exert upward pressure on interest rates and prices. During the 2020 to 2026 period, those factors, along with slower growth in federal outlays and the expiration of reductions in personal income tax rates, dampen economic growth. After 2026, economic growth is projected to rise slightly, matching the growth rate of potential output by 2028. 
Between 2018 and 2028, real actual output and real potential output alike are projected to expand at an average annual rate of 1.9%. In our forecast, the growth of potential GDP is the key determinant of the growth of actual GDP through 2028, because actual output is very near its potential level right now, and is projected to be near its potential level at the end of the period. Potential output is projected to grow more quickly than it has since the start of the 20, 2007 to 2009 recession, as the growth of productivity increases to nearly its average over the past 25 years. Nonetheless, potential output is projected to grow more slowly than it did in earlier decades, held down by slower growth of the labor force, which results from partly, partly results from the ongoing retirement of baby boomers. In our projections, the effects of the 2017 Tax Act on incentives to work, save, and invest raise real potential GDP through the 2018 to 2028 period. Over the same period, the Tax Act is projected to boost the level of real GDP by an average of 0.7% and non-farm payroll employment by an average of 1.1 million jobs. Our current economic projections differ from those that we made in June of 2017 in a number of ways. The most significant is that potential and actual real GDP are projected to grow more quickly over the next few years. Projected output is greater because of the recently enacted legislation, data that has become available after our previous economic projections were completed, and improvements in our analytical methods. Over the next decade, the unemployment rate is lower in our current projections than in our previous ones, particularly during the next few years when economic stimulus boosts demand for labor. Although both short and long-term interest rates are projected to be higher on average from 2018 to 2023. Turning to the budget projections, we estimate that the 2018 budget will total $804 billion, $139 billion more than the $665 billion shortfall recorded in 2017. In our projections, budget deficits continue increasing after 2018. As deficits accumulate, Debt held by the public rises from 78% of GDP, or $16 trillion, at the end of this year, to 96% of GDP, or $29 trillion, by 2028. That percentage would be the largest since 1946, and well more than twice the average over the past five decades. For the next few years, revenues hover near the 2018 level of 16.6% .6 of GDP in our projections. Then they rise steadily, reaching 17.5% of GDP by 2025. At the end of that year, many provisions of the 2017 Tax Act expire, causing receipts to rise sharply to 18.1% of GDP in 2026 and 18.5% in 2026, 2027, and 2028. They have averaged 17.4% of GDP over the past 50 years. In our projections, outlays for the next three years remain near 21% of GDP, which is higher than their average of 20.3% over the past 50 years. After that, outlays grow more quickly than the economy does. That increase reflects significant growth in mandatory spending, mainly because of the aging of the population and rising health care costs per beneficiary are projected to increase spending for Social Security and Medicare, among other programs. It also reflects significant growth in interest costs, which are projected to grow more quickly than any other major component of the budget the result of rising interest rates and mounting debt. By 2028, net outlays for interest are projected to be roughly triple what they are in dollar terms this year, roughly double when measured as a percent of GDP. In contrast, discretionary spending is projected to decline in relation to the size of the economy. For the 2018 to 2027 period, we now project a cumulative de deficit that is $1.6 trillion larger than the $10.1 trillion deficit that we anticipated in June. Projected revenues are lower by one trillion and projected outplays are higher, outlays are higher by half a trillion. Laws enacted since June 2017, above all the three mentioned earlier, are estimated to make the equivalent deficit, the cumulative deficit $2.7 trillion larger than previously projected between 2018 and 2017. However, revisions to our economic projections caused us to reduce our estimate of the cumulative deficit by $1 trillion over the same period, mainly because of the expectations of faster growth in the economy and in wages and corporate profits. Other changes had relatively small effects on the projections. CBO also analyzed an alternative scenario in which current law was altered to maintain major policies that are now in place. 
so that substantial tax increases and spending cuts would not take place as scheduled under current law and to provide more typical amounts of emergency funding than the sums provided for in 2018. In that scenario, far larger deficits and much greater debt would result than in the CBO's current baseline projections. Debt held by the public would reach about 105% of GDP by the end of 2018, an amount that has been exceeded only once in the nation's history. Moreover, the pressures contributing to that rise would accelerate and push debt up even more sharp, sharply in subsequent decades. Such high and rising debt would have serious negative consequences for the budget in the nation. In particular, the likelihood of a fiscal crisis in the United States would increase. I appreciate the invitation to testify today about CBO's budget and economic outlook. I would be happy to answer questions. Thank you for your testimony and uh, even more for the expanded documents that you, you do to uh, help us know where things are going. Um, we'll now begin a round of questions, and uh, I think everybody knows how we alternate back and forth, and it's based on being here at the sound of the gavel or uh, arrival sunset time. Um, so I'll begin my questions. The uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act has already stimulated the economy, putting more dollars in the hands of hardworking Americans and businesses for investments. As we look forward to the reduction in the business tax rates, um, are the, see there are they are incentivizing more work and higher investment. And I noticed in your chart on Table 2 that uh, revenues um, grow every single year. Um, I noticed that outlays grow every single year too and more substantially than revenues do, which is, which is the problem that we need to, to solve. Uh, can you expand on the expected individual and business response to the tax bill in the medium term? Sure. Um, we have forecast that the Tax Act will, will encourage savings, investment, and work. Um, the reduction in, um, in lower, the lower tax rates and the uh, bonus expensing, we think, will lower the uh, um, user cost of capital and increase investment in the economy and boost GDP growth. Uh, we also see that the effective marginal tax rates on labor income is also down. Uh, we think that will increase labor force participation, hours worked, and increase employment throughout the 10-year period. Um, we also think that, uh, that the, the reduction in effective marginal tax rates on both capital and, and labor will have a significant effect. And I think our, our average boost to GDP over the 10-year period is, is uh, 0.7 percentage points higher over the 10-year period uh, because of the Tax Act. So we were, we were hoping for 0.4, so 0.7 is good news. Uh, excluding intergovernmental transfers and counting only income from sources outside the government, such as Social Security payroll taxes and Medicare premiums, uh, you estimate that the trust fund programs will add to deficits through the 2019 to 2028 period by amounts that grow from $655 billion to, in, in 2019 to $1.5 trillion in 2028. These trust fund programs will add a total of 10 and 2 tenths trillion to the deficit over the 10-year budget window. Um, is the current trajectory of these programs fiscally sustainable? And without legislative action, which year do you project that the uh, Social Security Disability Trust Fund and Medicare's Hospital Insurance Trust Fund will be exhausted? Not that I'm suggesting cuts in those. I'm suggesting solutions somehow, but if you can. Right. Well, the, the, um, the aging of the population and the, the rise in health care costs, we think, will, is, are, are the major forces driving the, the increase in the deficit over the next 10 years and, and beyond. Um, that's, that's exactly right. The, uh, the uh, health insurance fund, for example, we think is going to run out of money in 2026. Um, we haven't, we haven't re-estimated the uh, old age and survivors insurance program, but our last estimate was that that will be exhausted in 2031. Thank you. Uh, the latest baseline includes more than $14 trillion in discretionary spending over the next 10 years. While the Armed Services Committee is able to authorize its spending each year, many of the non-defense programs remain unauthorized, a problem that persists. 
I know that CBO prepares a report each year on unauthorized appropriations, but this year it was released prior to final appropriations being enacted. Assuming defense continues to be authorized on an annual basis, do you have an estimate of what portion of this $14 trillion in your current baseline is unauthorized? Uh, we, we really don't. Uh, you know, the last estimate we did was 2016, and it was a, it was a pretty large number. It's about $310 billion. Uh, we, we haven't we haven't updated the estimate. We we don't really want to forecast too much because uh, obviously Congress decides what to authorize going forward. So that number that number could change. Okay, I think we'll be interested in getting that number anyway. Okay. Um, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act made the corporate rate permanent to ensure long-term investment decisions that businesses have to make over the long term, and uh, show the U.S. as a competitive market. Uh, Dr. Hall, does the lower statutory corporate rate encourage firms to locate their establishments to domestically? Uh, yes, we, we, we do believe that the overall effect of the Tax Act is to make the U.S. a uh, more appealing location for, for business activity. So we actually do see that the reduction in corporate rates and some of the changes in the international tax system uh, will boost investment and, and actually increase investment in the, uh, in the United States from, before, from abroad. Thank you. My time's expired. Dr. Sanders. Thank you for the doctorate. Sure. <laughs> but I just got, <laughs> barely made it through college, though. That's oh. <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Hall, um, um, as you know, um, the President Trump and some of my Republican colleagues uh, said over and over again that the re, uh, tax cuts, tax cut bill would pay for itself. Uh, on page 128 of your report uh, on the budget and the economy, however, the CBO projects that the Trump tax plan will increase the deficit by nearly $1.9 trillion over the next 11 years. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So, my friends, uh, at the end of how many hours we have sat in this room, hearing about the benefits of trickle-down economics that magically, if you give tax breaks to billionaires, it's going to create all the growth, and uh, tax revenues will increase uh, to overcome the deficit. turns out not to be true. Uh, Dr. Hall, um, uh, President Trump, among others, has claimed that, uh, this is a quote from Trump, quote, the rich will not be gaining at all with this tax plan, end of quote. Uh, but according to the Tax Policy Center, by the end of the decade, 83% of the benefits of the Trump tax plan go to the top 1% top and 60% of the benefits go to the top one-tenth of 1%. 1 Is that roughly accurate? I think that's their estimate. We haven't, we haven't done a similar, uh, similar calculation, though. So in other words, what we are talking about is a tax plan that significantly grows the deficit and almost all of the benefits go to the very, very wealthiest people in this country. Um, one of the issues that concerns me is that um, what we are seeing happening to working families uh, all across this country, and Dr. Hall, I don't know if you've even seen it, uh, but a report came out literally today from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and the report tells us that the average worker in America has seen zero zero wage growth over the past year after adjusting for inflation. In March of 2017, the typical non-manager in America made about $22.60 an hour. In March of 2018, that same worker made the same $22.60 an hour. Does that sound roughly right to you? I, I, it does sound roughly right, yes. Right. So what I would say, uh, and... Dr. Hall, while we're at it, can you um, talk a little bit about income and wealth inequality? Is it true, based on your understanding, that the three wealthiest people in this country now own more wealth than the bottom half of the American people? Uh, that, that, I, that I don't know. We did just release a report. I don't have the, the numbers in my head. We did just release a report in the past few weeks, actually, about income inequality. That's, that's worth, worth looking at. Okay, well, we will... We will do that. Um, 
my colleague from Wyoming, the chairman, uh, talked about uh, Social Security and Medicare. Uh, I introduced legislation that would lift the cap on taxable Social Security income for people making $250,000 a year or more. Now, everybody is concerned about the financial uh, future of Social Security. That is a legitimate concern. If you lift, correct me if I'm wrong here, but according to the Social Security Administration, if you lift the cap on income of 250000 or more, which is just the very highest income earners in this country, Social Security will be solvent for the next 60 years, and we can increase benefit for lower income, benefits for lower income Social Security beneficiaries. Does that sound right to you? I, I don't know if that's true or not. I haven't, haven't looked at right. their... According to the Social Security Administration. So for all people who are concerned about the solvency in Social Security, the answer is not to cut benefits, but at a time of massive income and wealth inequality, to ask the people on top to start paying their fair share of taxes so that we can protect the many, many millions of people today who are struggling to keep their heads above water. In my state and I'm sure in every state in this room. And we don't talk about this enough. Mr. Chairman, it might be worth a hearing on this. You got a lot of elderly people who are cutting their prescription drugs in half, can't afford the medicine that they need, can't afford to keep warm in the wintertime. We had a real crisis in terms of poverty among elderly people in this country. And the answer is not to be talking about cutting Social Security or Medicare. The answer is to be strengthening those programs through a fair attack system. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Senator Grassley. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your work, uh, Director Hall. Uh, sorry that there's such a bleak picture painted. Um, having the uh, public debt go from 78% to 96% of gross national product isn't very good news. I hope Congress thinks about the impact on our children and grandchildren, uh, but with that debt and deficit. Uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle want to make uh, this all about revenue and the historic tax cuts that we enacted. Uh, I think uh, that that completely disregards the positive economic effects of these reforms that I think you pointed out in your exchange with the, the chairman. So my first question is, kind of carrying on where the chairman left off, is it not accurate based on your analysis that the tax reforms enacted last year will increase economic growth, lead to lower unemployment, increase hours worked, increase capital investment, and increase wages? Yes, those are all true. Yeah. So then I have to conclude that when Democrats say that they want to repeal tax reforms, that they're really telling the American people that they want fewer jobs and lower wages, and uh, no American's going to think that's acceptable. Uh, based on your analysis, how would allowing the individual tax reforms to expire after 2025 impact the economy? Well, we think that will be sort of the opposite of stimulus. We actually do think it will help, help slow, slow growth. Um, one of the reasons we did the alternative... Uh, scenario was to assume that, that some of those things like the tax tax rates don't expire and they continue to give, give you an idea of that. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> instead of asking a question, unless you disagree with this percentage, uh, I'm, I'm going to say uh, that revenue as a percentage of GDP has averaged 17.4% over the last 50 years. According to your analysis, uh, what will revenue as a percentage of DD, GDP be in 2025, which is prior to the expiration of the individual tax reforms? Um, if, if the number, I, I, I think it's somewhere up north of 18% of GDP, so it's, okay. it's a bit higher. Well, if you're saying north of 18%, then that's uh, even better than what I thought it was going to be, 175 uh, so even with the tax cuts enacted last year, fully in effect, revenue as a percentage of GDP will exceed the historic average. 
Uh, that, that's right. And, and I did misspoke. I, I got the year wrong. You're, you're right. It is 17.5% 7, in 2025. Okay. I was looking at the next year. Now, turning to spending, is it correct that over the past 50 years that spending has averaged about 20.3% of GDP? Yes. And what do you project spending to average over the next 10 years as a percentage of GDP? Um, it's some, I, I don't have the number right in front of me, I'm sorry, but it's, it's something north of 21%. Yeah, I think quite a bit north. Okay. Um, I don't know whether these uh, figures come from you, but I have down here 22.4, reaching 23.6 in 2028. 20, uh, that, that sounds right. I, I'm sure that's... And what are the primary drivers of spending growth? Well, primary drivers are, are things related to the aging population and, and health care costs. So it's, it's things like uh, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and, and those, the, the entitlements because of the uh, aging population. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think I agree with that. I don't know whether these percentages are accurate, but uh, the, they take up 12.9% uh, of GDP today, and that's going to go up to 149 while discretionary spending, that, that part that we appropriate every year, is projected to fall one percentage point. Uh, so in sum, revenues, even with tax cuts, will remain on a par with historic averages, but spending is set to increase significantly over historic norms. It seems to me that if we're going to get control of our growing debt and deficits, our focus needs to be on the spending side particularly mandatory spending programs, I yield. Senator Wyden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Hall, good to see you again, and your professionalism is always appreciated. Here in this room, a bipartisan tax reform bill was produced by then-Chairman Judd Gregg, and I was proud to be one of the sponsors of it. Our approach would have put the bulk of the tax relief into the pockets of the middle class rather than the multinational corporations. Unfortunately, our colleagues on the other side rejected that bipartisan approach and others and decided to put the massive tax cuts for the multinational corporations on the national credit card. So let me keep you clear of politics, and let's just walk through a couple of numbers so we can be clear about this. So in the updated outlook, you all estimate that the Trump tax law is going to increase the deficit by almost $1.9 trillion over the budget window, even after taking economic feedback, economic possibilities into account. Nearly $600 billion of that cost is due just to bigger interest payments on all this new debt. So here's my question, and just apropos of the numbers. Besides slashing Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, I don't know where else Republicans could possibly go to pay for this $1.9 trillion dollars in debt largely going to the multinational corporations. In fact, when I sort of strip the budget down, it would seem to me that cutting the defense budget would be the only other realistic option. What is missing here with that analysis? Well, you know, I don't, I don't want to make recommendations, I suppose, on... on on how to fix the problem. I, I, I don't want you to. I just want to hear, I mean, I guess when I looked at it last night, I said mm -hmm. maybe they could cut everything discretionary, like NIH, and we'd lose the prospects of research. But basically, other than the Defense Department and cutting that, where else would they go, or could they go, on social, other than Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid? Um, I actually have a, one of my favorite figures here. It gives you a little bit of insight. If you, uh, from the report, figure 4-3. Uh, right now, net interest alone is about 1.6% of GDP. And that number is going to triple. Just the net interest payments is going to triple over the next 10 years. 
and that will become about 3.1% of GDP. That's big, bigger than all of defense spending, discretionary spending. It's bigger than all of non-defense discretionary spending. So my, my point is that the interest cost is starting to just swamp uh, uh, things like defense spending and non-defense spending. So it's, it's whatever, whatever the fix is going to be, it needs to be something that's pretty big. So you can't just wave your hands and sort of throw up fairy dust and say you're going to drive down the debt. I mean, I'm just looking at three ranges of kind of numbers. Mm -hmm. One of them, when you have that amount of debt, is, and this is where I think they're going, is Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and I base that on their budget proposal for this year. Then I think you could wipe out the uh, discretionary budget, NIH and, and parks and the like. But I can't see any other budgetary you know, real estate. And I know my time is, is almost almost up. Can you give me some examples for, uh, for other possibilities than what I mentioned? Well, I think looking at that figure, it gives you some idea of sort of where, where the buckets are. But even that is sort of underestimating the problem because that's just the interest cost. That's just getting a deficit down towards zero. Um, we then would then have a huge amount of debt sitting out there. So I think the problem's even more extreme than that. Well, I, I'm not going to pummel this any, any, any longer, and you have certainly made a very good point with respect to the debt. But when the growth projections are nowhere near what was promised, number one, the middle class aren't seeing what they were told they were going to get, which was a $4,000 pay raise and the middle class drives 70% of the American economy, I don't see how growth is going to get you close to paying for that $1.9 uh, trillion that was put on the credit card. And it still leaves us with the safety net and defense, unless you want to cut the discretionary programs, and I don't see that being proposed either. So I'll look forward to talking with you about this more, and I certainly share your view about the debt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Corker. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and uh, Dr. All, thank you for being here. I, I have several committee assignments like most people here, and uh, this has nothing to do with our leadership. I find this to be the least serious committee that I serve on, but we thank you for being here today. And it seems like it's always a sort of a partisan, whoever's in charge, uh, tit for tat. None of us, none of us have covered ourselves in glory. Uh, this Congress um, and this administration likely will go down as one of the most fiscally irresponsible administrations and congresses that we've had. Um, I, my best vote, one of the best votes I've made here was the Budget Control Act of 2011. And we didn't finish the work by alleviating the sequester by making the cuts that needed to be made. I was not on the special committee. I don't know if anybody here was, but, but we didn't finish our work. And so we ended up with a sequester. But it was the best vote that I have made uh, in that we at least capped domestic spending for a period of time. It would have been better if we did our work. You've talked about the cost of this tax bill, and if it ends up costing what has been laid out here, it could well be one of the worst, worst votes I've made. I hope that is not the case, and I hope there's other data to, uh, to assist, whether it's jobs or growth or whatever, but I want to get back to that in a moment. But the, the, the thing that's never talked about here is we, I, I just, the bipartisan budget Maya McGinnis's group just did an analysis on the bipartisan budget agreement that we just passed. You did not do that in your papers because it had just happened. But I think you're saying that the tax bill could add $1.9 trillion in debt over the next 10 years. The spending bill that we just passed, if policy continued, would be $2.1 trillion. Um, would you say that what we did, in fairness, passing the spending bill we just passed, would add 
about the same order of magnitude of indebtedness over a 10-year period as the tax bill. Yeah, actually, um, we do have a bit of an estimate. I think the, uh, the add to discretionary spending from, from those two bills is about $650 billion over 10 years. The, the what? Uh, the Bipartisan Budget Act and the, and the uh, Omnibus, they combined to add about $650 billion to the deficit over 10 years. Yeah, not, not under current policy. Well, that, yeah, that is under... That, that is absolutely... Uh, surely, don't tell me that. I mean, you're going to lose all credibility. Uh, $650 billion in debt over current policy over what we just passed? Yes. About, about $305 billion of that is, is from, from exceeding the caps. And then we added about another $330 billion to spending um, not subject to the caps. So if you add $150 billion a year in spending over 10, we added $150 billion to the baseline, did we not? Um, you mean in, in... This last... We just added $150 billion to the baseline. How could you multiply that by 10 and come up with $650 billion? I mean, with any growth at all, it's going to be in the $2 trillion range when you include debt service. Right, right. The, um, if you look at the table A1, we've got the, the change, changes in, our, in our, um, our budget forecast since June 2017. And if you look under discretionary outlays, you'll see that we have a forecast here of discretionary outlays adding about around $650 billion to the, uh, to the deficit over the 10 years that, that didn't exist before. If you keep current policy in place. Right, that's right. I, I want to follow up with you on okay, that. Okay, sure. I, 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 that cannot be accurate. Okay. Okay, I mean, just, it's, it's, I mean, just, if you just do the math, you add $150 billion to the baseline, you multiply it by 10, uh, it cannot be accurate. But anyway, okay. the point is that we've had both spending that has increased the deficit and tax reform that has increased the deficit. Is that correct? That's right. So really, we've had both sides of the aisle. The only, the only three people on, on this committee that haven't been involved in increasing the de deficit since over the last 15 months are Senator Harris, Senator Sanders, and Senator Merkley. And I don't think it's because they're fiscal conservatives. I think it's because they didn't agree with the priorities that were in these bills. But they're the only three that haven't participated in increasing the deficit. We all have participated. I voted against the spending. Some of you voted against a tax bill. But let's face it, I mean, both sides of the aisle are totally remiss as it relates to deficits. And, I, I mean, I listen to this partisan bickering over blaming people. It's, just, it's ridiculous. We, we are absolutely uh, not capable of dealing with our country's finances. And, of course, a big part of it is the American people don't really want it to be controlled. I want to get back with you on the numbers, and I know sure. my time is up. The thing that is confusing to me, I, I noticed that, and I'll close with this, uh, on page 117, you've got the growth at 0.7%, an average increase growth of 0.7% over the 10-year period. And we were looking at an average growth increase of 0.4% paying for this bill uh, that was passed, the tax reform bill. And I, I'm just confused as to whether that's just a seven-tenths increase in the baseline, and there really isn't that much growth. I'm confused over that. So I want to get, I want to get back sure. to you on okay. that. I know my time is up. Well, one thing that might be confused, that's a, that's a level. So we think GDP, on average, the level would be seven-tenths higher over 10 years so, on an average. Senator Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And Dr. Hall, I want to start by thanking you and your team for your nonpartisan uh, professional work. And as your report clearly indicates, uh, the claims that the recent tax cut would pay for itself were pure fantasy. Uh, you indicate here that even with uh, additional economic growth, uh, the debt uh, will increase by close to $2 trillion over 10 years. I want to dig down a little bit into the different impact this tax bill has on gross domestic product 
versus gross national product? Because both are measures of our economy, but am I correct in saying that gross national product is a better measure of the income that comes to the people of the United States? That's right. Gross domestic product focuses on where things are made, and gross national product focuses on, on who gets the income from what's made. Right. So to the extent that the Republican tax law boosts gross domestic product by more than gross national product, it's because some of that income from increased economic activity is flowing to foreigners instead of Americans, right? Right. And, and one of the big reasons is, is the big increase in borrowing that yep. we're having to do both national, privately and, and publicly uh, is coming from abroad. So when you borrow money, you owe interest payments. Right. Those interest payments are income that flow out of the country. Right. And it's also a fact that uh, in, if you look at the stock of, of American companies, 35% uh, of that stock is currently owned by foreigners. So when there's a stock buyback, that's money that flows directly into the pockets of somebody uh, overseas, non-Americans. In fact, if you dig into your report, you find that by 2028, uh, CBO concludes that the Republican tax law boosts gross domestic product by 0.5 percent, but boosts gross national product by only 0.1 percent. Is that right? That's correct. All right. So doesn't this mean that roughly 80 percent of the income from the increased activity of the tax plan in the final year when it's fully kicked in is going to foreigners? Yeah, I'm not sure I would characterize it that, that way, but, but I, I, I get your point about well, you, Mr. Hall, Dr. Hall, you just said that the GDP is a measure right. of the total economy and the difference between GNP and GDP is the amount that's going sure. to foreigners. Sure. So you are finding that GDP is growing a lot faster in year 10 that's right. than GNP, right? That's right. And in fact, it's five times faster, right? Right. All right. So 80 percent, I just want to be clear, Mr. Chairman, 80 percent of the benefit of increased economic activity from the tax law is going in the pockets of foreigners. So every dollar of increased economic activity in 2028, 80 cents of that is not going into the pockets of hardworking Americans that the chairman referred to. It's going in the pockets of foreigners, right? Well, you know, I think I, I, your calculation is right. I'm just not sure that's how exactly how I'd look at the benefits of or the impact of the tax act by just well, the, well as the you GDP. said, it's it's, it's in here your report. And let me ask you about. Two I, I'm not trying to argue. I got just that, want to be let, more. Thoughtful. Let me ask you about two parts of the plan that I spent tried to spend a lot of time on the floor warning my colleagues about, and this has to do with the foreign minimum tax. Here, it's called the global intangible low tax income guilty for short. Right. Um, you're familiar with that piece. Yes. And then there's another part that's a deduction for profits from foreign sales, uh, which they call the FDII, or FIDI, right? That's right. Okay. And on page 109 of your report, uh, you state, quote, by locating more tangible assets abroad, a corporation is able to reduce the amount of foreign income that is characterized as guilty, Similarly, by locating fewer tangible assets in the United States, a corporation can increase the amount of U.S. income that can be deducted as FDII. And you conclude, together, the provisions may increase corporations' incentives to locate tangible assets abroad. Just to translate into English, when we talk about moving tangible assets abroad, we're talking about things like plant and equipment and that kind of thing, right? Right, although I, I don't want to exaggerate that. Part of what we were doing there is, is pointing out that, that it's, it's pretty complicated. And, yeah, and you, I, I'm you get just, some of this. Doctor, I'm just reading your, from your report. I, and your findings here are consistent with that of lots of economists, uh, as you right. know, that this provision, the way this provision was written, uh, creates this perverse incentive uh, to ship jobs overseas. And if a corporation does succeed in lowering its tax bill by moving its factory overseas along with the jobs, then they're effectively getting a tax break by moving plant and equipment overseas, aren't they? Yeah, I just want to put it into context, though. We think overall the Tax Act is going to encourage investment in the United States on the whole, not, yeah. not abroad. But part of that investment, as we talked in the earlier question, is right. from foreigners. Right. And foreigners That's right. in year 2028 are getting 80 cents of every dollar of increased income from economic activity. Right. Part of that may yeah. well be foreign. Right. Companies. So, right. yes, more foreign investment and more profits for, for foreigners in a bill that was sold as something that was going to help the American worker. Final question relates to the other 
half of the guilty, which is the FDII. Right. Would you agree that's a tax expenditure? Um, well, it's not our call. It'll be the Joint Committee on Taxation. They'll, they'll follow up with that. Is that the kind of thing that you have in the past have said is a sort of a, a tax break that well, well, people we, get we that others don't? Actually, we haven't. We, we rely on the J, JCT uh, to, to make that determination. I, I, I just find it ironic, no. Mr. Chairman, that we've got now what is a government program that encourages the people to move plants and equipment overseas. I thank you. Right. Senator Cotton. Thank you, Director Hall, for your appearance and your, and your testimony. There's been a lot of talk so far uh, about the macroeconomic pictures, about budget debt and deficits and economic growth and so forth. Let's bring it down to the micro picture, how it in, what this means for families. The CBO outlook projects an unemployment rate in 2019 of 3.3%, uh, historically low, so that's good news. Um, Maybe even better news, CBO projects an increase in hourly wages and attributes that increase to competition for labor among businesses because the bidding up of wages is necessary to attract new employees and retain existing workers. Director Hall, what are the policies fostering that competition and leading to the increase in hourly wages? Well, we're ending the slack in our economy, but we have a lot of stimulus from the, from the Tax Act and the, uh, the other two bills. So that stimulus really is pushing GDP growth above potential, and so we're getting this very low unemployment rate, we think, in higher employment. And, and does, that mean, does that mean that some of, some of the gains from that growth, whatever it may be, we have our differences between the two parties, but some of the gains from that growth uh, will accrue to a greater degree to labor than it will to capital, since you're seeing wage increases for people's labor? Well, yeah, there, there will be benefit for labor, and we do see a, a, actually a decline in the marginal tax on, on labor as good. a result. Well, I think that's a good thing, given that labor for many decades now, especially unskilled, low-skilled laborers, people who are getting out of high school and going straight into the workforce or maybe not getting a high school degree, haven't seen their wages increase. Um, I also think one important policy that we need to continue is immigration enforcement, and I think that we need to take a look at our immigration levels, because obviously we could increase our uh, abstract uh, GDP simply by bringing in millions of more workers. I mean, the way you increase your GDP is more productivity or, or more workers, but that wouldn't necessarily be good for America's families. It wouldn't necessarily be good for GDP on a per capita or a per household basis. I want to turn now to something that I, that I did not see in your report. Um, I looked at your report. I looked at your testimony. I did not see um, much, if anything, about national defense and military spending. Did I, did I overlook that, or did you not put much focus there? Yeah, no, I think, I think we, we didn't put a ton of focus. Yeah. We did our usual. And, and I, I raise that because uh, I want to make the point that I don't think our military is responsible for driving much of these deficits in the debt, debt we face now. And I think your report makes that clear, in part by not discussing the increased military spending. There's no doubt that we increased military spending sub substantially um, this year and next year. Um, but as your report makes clear, the long-term debt picture is driven by primarily by uh, retirement, especially health care spending. Is that right? That's right. And I would even make the case that, that in the long term, military spending is essential for controlling our deficits and ultimately our national debt because it creates the international system in which our economy operates. I have a, a few figures here. It's the end of World War II about international trade and investment. Um, the trade expansion uh, in the United States has produced roughly $2.1 trillion in economic gains. That translates into more than $7,000 per person and more than $18,000 per household, and that our economy is uh, about 13% larger than it would have been absent that increase. Uh, it's hard to imagine that kind of increase in, in trade happening if we had had a conflict on the scale of World War II again. No doubt there's been many wars, and our nation has participated in many of those wars, but certainly we have not had the kind of great power conflict uh, in this world that we saw from 1939 to 1945. The Federal Reserve Bank studied the effect of war on trade and concluded that it not only severely diminished trade in the long term for countries directly involved, but even for neutral countries, you saw declines in trade of up to 10%. Um, and it's the United States military that's been creating that environment, that's been patrolling the seas, securing critical choke points, forcing you know, our allies to conciliate or mediate their differences so their small conflicts don't rise into big conflicts, uh, as well as deterring first the Soviet Union and now some other peer competitors from the kind of adventurism that launched us into World War II and before that World War I. Um, so we spend a lot on our military, and we spend a lot more than every other nation uh, many 
of the closest nations combined, but that's in part because military competition is so destructive of economic growth and prosperity, and therefore we can't afford to skimp on it. Um, I took that to be the message of the absence of much discussion of military spending in your uh, most recent report and your testimony, is that the military is one of the most fundamental things our government spends taxpayer dollars on and that we have to continue to do so if we have any hope of achieving the prosperity that we all hope for our country. Thank you. Senator Harris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning. I reviewed the CBO's outlook for the next decade, and uh, I'm deeply concerned about the increase to the deficit, as many of the members of this committee have expressed. I'm especially troubled that much of the deficit increase can be attributed to the Republican tax plan that was passed a few months ago, which will add nearly $1.9 trillion to the deficit. According to the CBO's analysis, the debt will exceed the size of the entire United States economy in just over a decade two years sooner than you forecasted in June. The debt problem created by a massive giveaway to the wealthy and corporations, uh, and by making the individual tax cuts expire in 2025 while making the corporate tax cuts permanent. This was a pure giveaway to the corporations and the top 1% of the United States. And when Congress talks about how we fix this deficit increase from the tax plan, some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle discuss the need for entitlement cuts. Entitlement cuts really mean cutting Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. It means cutting the main program, programs 4.3 million seniors in my home state of California rely on seniors who deserve to retire with dignity. For my constituents, retiring, the dig retiring with dignity means being able to afford their prescription drugs. It means not living paycheck to paycheck and having the peace of mind that government will not take away the benefits promised to them. At a time when so many seniors cannot afford their life-saving medications, we need a budget that allows Medicare to negotiate drug prices what we don't need is a budget that cuts $500 billion from the program over the next decade. When trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act this past year, uh, congressional members proposed cutting Medicaid by $700 billion, the same program that cuts six out of 10 seniors uh, in nur nur nursing home uses. Nearly two-thirds of California seniors depend on Social Security for at least half of their annual income, an average of $21,300. With cuts to Social Security, millions of seniors would struggle to make ends meet. So when we discuss balancing the budget, we need to speak the truth that this tax plan has ballooned the deficit for the purpose of delivering billions of dollars to the top 1% while putting access to affordable health care and a shot at a decent retirement at risk for anyone else. So Dr. Hall, my question is, based on your updated budget outlook, can you tell me whether the effects of this tax bill, either directly or indirectly, impact the future solvency of Medicare and Social Security? Well, well, certainly anything that adds to the um, deficit in the debt is, is going, to, going to have an impact on things going forward. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we get a little boost in economic growth that, that might extend the, the, um, the exhaustion dates, but the basic problem is, is still there, and, and the basic issue of, of the debt getting to an unsustainable level is, is maybe more intense than it, than it was before. And will you agree that it's going to have a disproportionate impact on the senior Americans? Um, I mean, it, it certainly, certainly changes in, in, uh, in Medicare and that sort of thing would, would have a disproportionate effect. I, I guess it depends upon how Congress decides to, to deal with the problem. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Merkley. Uh, thank you very much for coming in and uh, bringing your expertise to bear on our economic situation. Uh, I was looking at numbers from the Joint Committee on Taxation, which laid out that uh, 17 out of every $20 in the, the benefits from the tax reductions goes to richer Americans, uh, or roughly 84%. 
Um, that did not include the estate tax, by the way, which was specifically excluded, which goes 100% to the very richest Americans. What is your analysis of the percent of the tax benefits that go to those who earn more than $100,000? We, uh, we haven't up updated those numbers. I mean, we, we did um, in this baseline. We haven't sort of tried to reproduce that. So, so I, I couldn't tell you anything different than, than what JCT has on, on the topic. Do you have any reason to think JCT is far off the mark? Uh, no, no, I don't. And would you agree that if you include the estate tax, the numbers would be even worse? That, that sounds right. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that's an important point because something that was sold as beneficial to the middle class uh, is uh, actually beneficial to the best off. And that brings me to the second point, which is your, your analysis shows that from 10 months ago till now, uh, the annual deficit has grown from an estimated $563 billion to an estimated $804 billion, uh, or roughly a $241 billion increase from 10 months ago. That, that's correct. Okay. And if it extends it over 10 years, I think your numbers were about $1.6 trillion? Yes. Uh, of just additional on top of the baseline that existed 10 months ago. That, that's right. clear. And is the, uh, how much of that is the uh, tax bill and how much is that is the spending bill? Done well, us? Yeah, the, um, it's a good question. The, the, the tax bill is a, is a big part of that. I think the tax bill is, I'm sorry, I'm late, let me look it up quickly. You bet. Um, Well, I say that I can I can tell you the spending part of it. The spending part actually is is forty to forty five percent of that increase, so it actually is a pretty significant part. But the remainder is is um, and probably more than the remainder is the uh, is the tax bill. So a great share of the tax bill, even if you include some growth projections, is funded through borrowing. Correct. Okay. So essentially, we have a bill that has borrowed from our children, because they're the ones that inherit the debt, to deliver the vast bulk of the benefits to the, the richest Americans? Um, that, that's, that's a way of looking at it. Well, I mean, it, it, but, well, not just a way of looking at it, but that is a fair, fair reading of the, the numbers? Well, which I, it, it obviously, it, it depends upon who, who winds up fixing the deficit, I suppose, as to who bears the burden about how Congress decides to, to deal with it. But, but delay is certainly... Um, Delay is certainly pushing the burden back in time. Okay. I want to uh, point out a pattern that I found quite interesting. Uh, under President Carter, we had essentially him closing out with the same deficit that existed the year before he took office, despite the, the oil shocks, about $73 billion. Under President Reagan, the deficit increased from 73 to 149, or roughly doubling. Under President Bush, the first president, we had essentially him closing out with the same deficit that existed the year before he took office, despite the, the oil shocks, about $73 billion. Under President Reagan, the deficit increased from 73 to 149, or roughly doubling. Under President Bush, the first President Bush, we had another near doubling going from 149 to 290. Under President Clinton, we had a reduction from 290 to a surplus of 236. So obviously a vast decrease in the deficit, in fact a surplus. Uh, and so we were reducing our national debt. Under Bush uh, the second, we had an increase from 236 to 458, so another rough doubling. And under President Obama, uh, the results of the recession, his first year in office, 1.4 trillion in deficit, reduced down to 584 when he left office. Why is it that the deficit decreases under Democratic leadership and increases under Republican leadership? I, I wouldn't want to offer an, an opinion on that. Have I read the numbers uh, accurately? That, that sounds right. Well, I do think it's an important point to make because what we have seen for a pattern that has increased our debt vastly has been Republican leadership has repeatedly taken us deep into the red. Democratic leadership has, has reduced that damage. 
And yet all we hear from our Republican colleagues is how they're fiscally responsible. How, how can one square the rhetoric with the reality? I, I wouldn't want to offer an opinion. It's not your responsibility to offer that, but I'm glad you confirmed that my numbers were accurate. I'll just close by saying that our children are now financing the biggest theft of money delivered to the wealthy in America, and this is what you normally see in corrupt, irresponsible third world governments, not the United States of America. Senator King. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dr. Hall, good to be with you. I I want to just draw your attention to page 33 of the report, and I'll just read a quote. I want to ask you about trade. Changes to trade agreements or tariff policies on the part of the United States and its trading partners that impede trade could have significant adverse effects on aggregate economic activity, whereas the removal of trade barriers between the United States and its trading partners could improve aggregate economic conditions. We had a hearing uh, recently where the head of the Council on Economic Advisors, Kevin Hassett, appeared before us. It was immediately after President Trump had indicated that he was going to impose tariffs on imported aluminum and steel. It was before any the, of the subsequent you know, potential retaliation discussion back and forth. I asked um, Kevin Hassett at the time, based on my understanding that the number of workers in American industries that make aluminum and steel is dramatically smaller than the number of workers that work in American industries that make things with aluminum and steel. I asked his economic opinion about whether the imposition of these tariffs would be a plus and minus, plus or minus for American workers, and he said that the economic literature would suggest that just looking at it that way before you get into a retaliation discussion, it would likely have a negative effect on jobs. Um, do, do you agree with that? Um, I, 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 I do. And then if we get into the subsequent retaliation issues, um, the, the aluminum and steel issues matter a lot to Virginians because I've got, you know, Coors Beer and Anheuser-Busch, you know, big breweries that are buying aluminum for cans. And I also have a Dublin truck plant in Pulaski that is, it's the only manufacturer of, of, of I'm sorry, Volvo trucks in Dublin. Pulaski County, Virginia is the only manufacturer that's going to raise their costs, raise costs to consumers. So there is some effect just on the aluminum and steel issue in Virginia, but over the course of the last couple of weeks, been on recess, traveling around, a lot of concern in Virginia on the ag side. The, the announcement by China that they would retaliate, especially with respect to things like soybeans and pork and some other agricultural products, are very challenging um, to Virginians. Talk a little bit about, and I don't know, have you at the CBO started to do any analysis of what either this, uh, the, the tariff on aluminum and steel, or more broadly, if retaliation were to occur, what would, what would the effect be on American workers and American farmers? Uh, we haven't. And, and in fact, our, our economic forecast closed about mid-February, so we really haven't taken any of that on board. Um, certainly, that's the sort of thing we, we would pay attention to and see how things turn out. And it would be something we would include in our baseline economic forecast uh, at, at, a, at a later date next time we do it or, or whenever uh, significant changes are made. You did generally agree with the way, uh, with the Hassett conclusion that the imports, uh, import tariffs on aluminum and steel are likely to be more negative than positive in American workers. Do you have an opinion about if there are retaliatory tariffs against the United States right. in the ag right. sector? You know, is that going to be a net good or a net bad in terms of uh, the workforce? Well, uh, you know, to, to be to be fair, the you know the real solution how how it winds up is sort of how it winds yeah. up. You know, rather, rather than than just this there's just one act like that. Mm -hmm. um, I do think a lot of the concerns um, I find them interesting because they're the inverse of the benefits of freer trade of having trade negotiations mm -hmm. or trade agreements. Mm -hmm. Right is is that is that you can have lower prices, you can have lower cost of production, you can have access to the foreign markets for with good with good trade agreements. Mm -hmm. So undoing undoing those can have the the reverse effect. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, to be fair, we have to sort of see where we wind up. We, we, we Some of the retaliation discussion is still kind of at the rhetorical level. Right. I guess the actual tariffs have been imposed on aluminum and steel, so that's real. But the retaliation discussion is a little bit rhetorical right now. Right, right, and, and we, we don't really know what sort of tariff changes 
the U.S. is likely to make or may make mm -hmm. going forward. Um, well, I, I'm just going to conclude and say I think it's interesting that um, the Constitution gives Congress really plenary power over trade in the Commerce Clause. We delegate to the President through Fast Track, which I support, the ability to negotiate trade deals and then set up a process for bringing those back for a congressional up or down vote. I think it's interesting that we want the say over a trade deal, but we allow presidents to start trade wars without a vote of Congress, even though the Constitution suggests that trade is ultimately for Congress. I, I, I don't think a president should be able to do a trade deal or start a trade war uh, without Congress giving it an imprimatur. And I, I hope to work with my colleagues to uh, uh, maybe come up with some improvements in the process so that there can't be a unilateral executive uh, decision to start a trade war when the Constitution reserves trade powers to Congress. But that's just my opinion. You needn't comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Whitehouse. Well, Mr. Chairman, it looks like I'm bringing up the rear here. We're just down to us and uh, Dr. Hall. Um, Dr. Hall, you and I have talked before about the health care spending projections graph. Right. And this is the one from that I've used before. Uh, but guess what? We have a new one. A new year has gone by. And just for the record, um, back here, when the Affordable Care Act passed, CBO did the yellow line estimate of what federal health care spending, all in, all the different federal health care programs, was expected to look like. Then as time went on, and we had the experience of the Affordable Care Act, and we had whatever else took place, we got this actual result, which came in below what was expected. And then here, there's been a new projection that is made going forward. So this is the old projection. This is the actual through this period, and this is the new projection. Now, in the graph that I used to use all the time, this savings delta was $3.3 trillion in savings between the expected uh, spending and the new projection. In this, the number goes up to $4.2 trillion. Now, I believe that about $300 billion of that relates to the repeal of the individual mandate. So you could back that out but that still leaves $3.9 trillion in savings, um, up from $3.3 trillion in savings just in the intervening year. And I think it's important to try to do whatever we can to figure out what is going on here. So I ask you to keep working with us on that. Um, this has a particular emphasis now because, as you know, there's a bicameral select committee working on trying to reform our budget process. And nobody has been more uh, eloquent than Chairman Enzi in understanding how broken our existing budget process is. It's one of the areas where he and I have considerable common cause uh, I think that one of the ways that we need to fix our existing broken budget process is that we need to have all of the elements that mathematically add to the debt to be considered in our budget process. So not just appropriated spending, but also health care spending, also tax expenditures, and also revenue. That's what mathematically leads to debt and deficit. Um, as a general proposition, do you agree with me that those are the four key elements that mathematically lead to our debt and deficits? Yes. Yeah. So if we're going to look at health care, we really need to start looking at ways to address this. And I completely disapprove of and will fight to my last breath to prevent attacking Medicare and Medicaid and other federal programs and taking benefits away from people in order to achieve savings, because I think there are better ways to achieve savings. I think there are efficiencies that can be gained. We are seeing some remarkable results out of some of the accountable care organizations, and it's very hard to extrapolate from 
Coastal Medical in the state of Rhode Island, a provider practice that has now reduced its per patient per year cost by $700, while dramatically improving the experience and the care that their patients get to $3.9 trillion in savings. But I suspect that there is something going on out there as we improve the payment system for the healthcare enterprise so that it's diverted less towards doing things to people and prescribing things for people and seeing people than it is to doing the things that keep people healthy so they don't need those things in the first place. And I just want to, first of all, uh, ask if you uh, concur with that as a general thought. And second, will you keep working with us? And if there are any ways that we can be helpful to try to figure out <laughs> what is, behind, you know, 3.9 trillion, that's a lot of money. Right. And it ought to be a matter of real priority to try to figure out what is working that has made that difference in this period. No, we, we are interested in that, that topic. We're interested. We're, we're trying, we are trying to do some work on that. Um, if for, I know you're interested beyond this, but if for no other reason we keep getting the forecast wrong, we keep having to lower our, our estimate of, of health care cost growth. And we'd like to, if we understood that better, we could give you a better forecast yeah. of, of future costs. So we are working on that. We'd be happy to follow up and talk to you a little bit about what we're, what we're doing. I know my time has expired, but may I ask an additional question, Chairman? Does your work to look at that, look at any, can you look kind of in any way down through to the experience of, say, a coastal medical or a Rhode Island primary care physicians or a provider group where they're actually seeing that cost not just not go up so fast, they're actually driving the cost right. down for their patients. And, and maybe that's too big of an extrapolation, but what does that look like from your perspective? Yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to do that. I think, I think that, is, that is certainly where we start working on this, is talking with providers and their experiences to get an understanding of what's happening at individual providers and see if we can find some common, uh, some common factors in there. So that's certainly going to be part of our methodology. Great. Well, thank you. Because surely, Mr. Chairman, if we could save $700 per person per year on health care expense while providing better care for people, that would be a pretty serious win-win. Yes, it would. I thank you for your comments at the, the last hearing regarding that and then sharing the information that you, you did with me. I will have to get together with you and ask a few questions about that, though, uh, to get more detail on how it uh, actually works. And uh, I thank you for your work on the, uh, the special budget task force as well. We're really relying on you to come up, as you did working bipartisan before, to come up with some solutions that uh, maybe we can fix that process. And well, we're much inspired by you. Something. We're much inspired by you, Mr. Chairman, and, and Senator Perdue and I, who are both on this committee, are doing our best to channel your concerns and your uh, wishes into that process. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I want to thank you, Dr. Hall, for your testimony today and for all of the documents that you uh, oversee the preparation of, and uh, your full statement will be included in the record. As information, all senators' questions for the record are due by 6 p.m. today with a signed hard copy delivered to the committee clerk in Dirksen 624. Under our rules, our witness has seven days from receipt of the questions to respond with answers. Uh, with no further business to come before the committee, the hearing is adjourned.